We left off last time talking about kwashiorkor and what it looks like to see someone starving to death. There's no muscles but an enlarged belly. And that doesn't mean they're full. It means that fluid has leaked out into their abdomen. So if you um, can help to feed people who are starving, that would be a wonderful thing that you could do. All right, the next thing, your book gives all kinds of statistics about red blood cells. I'd like for you to know that they carry oxygen, and I would like for you to know that they don't have a nucleus. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And this is the really cool picture this is a couple of red blood cells going through a capillary. So capillaries are so small that the red blood cells can barely fit through. And we're going to find out when we talk about sickle cell, they won't fit through. So they get uh, like a log jam, and then they start breaking. So apparently it is excruciatingly painful. And of course, if your red blood cells pop, then uh, you can't carry oxygen. So, anyway, not, not a good thing. Here is a white blood cell going through a capillary, and they can only go through single file. So this is kind of a cool picture. I like this one. Inside of the red blood cell is hemoglobin. So here's a kind of an artist representation. Hemoglobin is made of four globin molecules, and they, they painted two of them purple and two of them gold in this particular picture. And then you have a heme molecule. So this, when they outline it like this and then say, look at this, this is actually the individual atoms that make up heme. So there's nitrogens, four nitrogens in this uh, orientation and they're holding an iron molecule in place so the the central part the active part of the hemoglobin is this iron molecule because oxygen likes to uh, is attracted to it but you want it to be attracted to it but not so tightly that it can't jump off and go um, somewhere in the body where it's needed so it's, we're amazingly made. You have four hemes per hemoglobin molecule. And if you don't eat food that has iron in it, and this is one of the problems that a lot of vegans, they just jump into it. They like the idea of being a vegan, but they don't really think through, how am I going to get the iron that I need? If you eat meat, you don't have any problem because it's red meat and it has iron in it. So you don't have any problem. But it's the people who are on altered or um, different diets that kind of have to look for that. Because if you don't take in iron, your body can store iron. But it can't store enough to make all the red blood cells that you need. So anyway, make sure you have a good source of iron. Now, one of the things that we always did when we were younger is we would push down on our fingernail... And when you do, if you take the end of the fingernail and push down, your fingernail turns white. And when you let back up on it, it pinks back up. It becomes pink again. And if it pinks back up immediately, then you are not anemic and you, you have plenty of iron and you have plenty of hemoglobin and life is good. But if you push down and it turns white and then you let up on it and it stays white for a while, you probably are anemic. So just a little something we used to do. So if your doctor's holding your hand and stroking the ends of your finger, um, now you know why. All right. I'm going through your PowerPoint. Um, that was one of the ways that uh, different teachers said, well, students like PowerPoint, so just go through and talk about the PowerPoint. So anyway... Y'all can give me some feedback and say, yes, I like that, or no, it's really boring, or whatever. So any feedback you give me, I will take um, into account. So in the bone marrow, you have stem cells. Now, they're not 
um, complete stem cells and that they can't turn into just anything that they want to. They're already committed to be, being some sort of, of blood. But whether they're going to go on and be white blood cells, whether they're going to go on and be um, red blood cells, or if they're going to turn into platelets, that's a decision that each stem cell has to make. So this one has decided to become a red blood cell. So it is a hemopoietic stem cell, and it's going to go through and make little baby red blood cells, and they call them erythroblast. Blast means you're not ready for prime time. You're, you're still an infant. So this is a, a, red, a baby red blood cell. And then as it matures and it's learning how to be a, a red blood cell and it's making its hemoglobin, you'll see the nucleus going away. So it actually throws out the nucleus. So now it's got a lot more room for hemoglobin and it has that typical red color. So we go from, erythro from stem cell to erythroblast to reticulocytes and then on to erythrocytes. So when we take a blood sample from you, we really shouldn't see reticulocytes out there. You might see a few, but by the time you're out in the bloodstream, you're ready for prime time and you're an erythrocyte. Site means cell. So you're a red blood cell instead of a red blood cell wannabe. All right. When your red blood cells die, which they will do because, hey, you just threw away the nucleus. So you have no way of fixing yourself. You have no repair mechanisms anymore because your nucleus is gone. So all of the red blood cells that die, we break them down and we break the heme down and we try and save the bits and pieces to recycle and make new hemoglobin to put in our newly formed uh, erythroblast. So here's a kind of a flow sheet here and you've got some iron, uh, say you've eaten a steak and your stomach acid will actually convert the iron into a form that can bind to a ferritin that's found in the stomach. So gastro means stomach. So this is a gastroferritin and it carries the iron down into your small intestines where it's dropped off and it's picked up and you have transferrin. So we had gastroferritin and now we have transferrin and we're going to carry it through the bloodstream and we're going to drop it off wherever uh, red blood cells are being made. So it's a kind of a cool process and we save a whole lot of the iron. Some of it comes out though, some of it we lose and some of it comes out in our feces and gives our feces its, its lovely color and in our urine and gives our urine its color. So that's a breakdown of blood products. All right. So this just kind of takes you through and shows you that you, you can absorb it through your stomach, through your intestines, and then you can use it in your liver. And you can store it there or release it there, depending on how much iron you need. Alrighty. Now, here is a mechanism. We're going to be talking about different kinds of mechanisms when we get into the endocrine system. But if you don't have enough oxygen in your body, and you all have probably put those little finger clamp things on and it tells you how much oxygen you have, you should be close to 100%. So there was a big thing about, oh, if you wear a mask, will your oxygen levels drop? And, and it does. Your oxygen level will drop down maybe, um, if you're 98 normally, you may drop down to maybe 95 so it actually does drop. But as long as you're above, say, 80% oxygen, you're, you're pretty much okay. But um, anyway, if your body says, hey, there's not enough oxygen going around, then the liver and the kidneys are going to sense this, and they're going to release a hormone called erythropoietin. And this erythropoietin goes to the bone marrow now, in a child, 
all of the bones are making red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets. But as you get older and older, the uh, other bones become full of fatty marrow, kind of a yellowy marrow, instead of the bright red marrow you have when you're making red blood cells. And so the older you get, you're making blood more in your flat bones, in your hips, in your sternum, in your skull. So that's kind of interesting. But little kids are making it in their arms and their legs everywhere because think about it, they have to grow up and they need lots and lots of uh, blood. But when you're older, your size is pretty much set. I mean, you may get a little fatter, but you're pretty much set on your size. So you really don't need to be making as much in the way of red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets. So the, the hormone that these guys send out comes down, stimulates the uh, stem cells, and says, okay, we need red blood cells because we're not getting enough oxygen. So the stem cells will start committing themselves to being um, red blood cells. So you can make red blood cells. So there's other things that will stimulate the bone marrow to make white blood cells, and there's other that will stimulate it to make um, uh, platelets, depending on what your need is. For this slide, I'm going to tell you a story about my family. I lost my father, not my father, my grandfather, and I lost an uncle to something called pernicious anemia. Nowadays, you just don't hear of anybody dying of pernicious anemia because we understand what's going on. But back then, um, they, they really didn't have a clue. And what's interesting is the uncle that I lost was actually an MD. He was a doctor, but he didn't know back then what the problem was. So when you're eating and you the food goes in your stomach, and then it goes in your small intestines to be absorbed. You have something uh, in your stomach called intrinsic factor that allows you to absorb vitamin B12. So you absorb it in your stomach, hopefully, if, if all things go well. And then once you get down in the intestines, you're going to uh, absorb iron, you're going to absorb amino acids. And of course, you remember that the liver is also a storage place for some iron. So here I have all the things that I need to make hemoglobin, the amino acids to make the, the, um, the globin and most of the heme and iron that we're going to put in it's going to be held in place by those nitrogens and vitamin D. Now, folic acid is important, too. And one of the things that they do if you're pregnant is they, they make you take folic acid because if you don't, the nervous system may not develop correctly. You may end up with a kid with spina bifida where their spinal column, the, the covering around it doesn't close correctly and you can't hold the fluid in. But we're going to talk about B12. We're going to talk about my, my grandfather. So if you don't have intrinsic factor, you can't absorb B12 out of your stomach. So even though you're eating beef or you're eating meats, you're eating things, or even taking a vitamin supplement, maybe you're taking a B12 supplement, you can't absorb it because it can't get out of your stomach. So had they known about it, all they would have had to do was give my grandfather or give my uncle a shot of B12. If you give them a shot and it goes into your bloodstream, it bypasses the stomach. So you don't have to try to absorb it out of the stomach and put it into the bloodstream. You've just injected it directly into the body where it can find its way into the bloodstream. So had they known, they, their lives could have been saved by just B12 shots. And you don't have to take them at every few months because it'll just slowly come out of your um, injection site and into your bloodstream. So anyway, that I just I found that so interesting and sad that they would die of something that, that nobody dies of anymore. But if you get everything that you need and then it can go into the bone marrow and you make 
the erythrocytes, they circulate for about 120 days. And then, again, because they threw their nucleus away, that's about as long as they can live. They become so uh, fragile. They become so messed up that when they're trying to push through capillaries, they just pop. And then you, you take the broken down pieces and recycle them. So this, your, your thing calls it expired erythrocytes. So you're past your 120-day expiration date. So the liver and the spleen break it down and send the bits and pieces of the hemoglobin in to be uh, degraded. And the pieces of the cell are phagocytized, so you actually have enzymes in your body that eat the bits and pieces and then spit it back out that you can use. Now, the hemoglobin that isn't uh, returned to the to the bloodstream will go on and be broken down some more. So you separate the heme and the globin. So it's not hemoglobin anymore. It's just heme or globin. The globin goes back to amino acids, and you can use them for anything you want. You can make proteins. You can make hormones. You can do all kinds of neat things with, with uh, amino acids. The heme is a little bit harder to, to break down. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to save that iron. So we're going to take the iron out of there and reuse it or store it. Or if you happen to be a lady, uh, you menstruate, so you lose blood that way. And if you're, if you're injured, you know, if you start bleeding, then you're going to lose blood that way. So you can just lose blood, the whole thing, the cell, the heme, the globe, and everything. You just lost it all. But if life works well, you are going to reuse your iron. You're going to store some of it and make some more uh, hemoglobin. And the rest of the heme breaks down and it turns colors. So Billy Verdon is more of a greenish color. Billy Rubin, more of a reddish color. And bile is kind of a really weird green color because it's got some of this uh, Billy Verdon in there too. And this eventually is released into the feces, giving you nice colorful feces. You probably didn't realize this, but if you bruise yourself or if someone gives you a hickey, what they've done in either of those cases is you've ruptured the capillaries and the red blood cells are underneath your skin. And your skin is so thin, you can actually see the red blood cells through your skin. And you see the red blood cells die. You see them pop open. And so think about the colors of a bruise. So first of all, it's, it's usually red, and then it kind of turns a kind of a purplish color and then after the purple color it looks kind of green can you see the the bruise or the hickey and the after tote goes green that's kind of a yellowish color and then once you've gotten past the yellow color then usually the bruise or the hickey is gone but it goes through those color changes and what you're actually watching is the heme being broken down into these colorful intermediates underneath your skin. And then eventually you, it washes out from under your skin and you recycle it into your body or send it to your feces or send it uh, to be uh, passed out in your urine. So here is a nice little table that summarizes all the different things that can cause you to have anemia. So anemia is not enough red blood cells. So you, the most common, I would say, is iron deficiency anemia. You just don't eat well, and so you don't have enough iron to make hemoglobin. So all the rest of the stuff is there, but the iron's missing, and if you don't have iron, you cannot make heme. Uh, this is the one nutritional anemia, the one that I was talking about. If you can't absorb B12, if you don't get enough folic acid, you know, your leafy green vegetables, things like that, then you don't get the folic acid or vitamin C deficiency. 
a lot of people stop and think about how when's the last time you had a glass of orange juice or you ate something that had vitamin C in it, drank some lemonade, for example, or took a vitamin C tablet or a multivitamin. So a lot of people don't get nearly enough vitamin C. And they're finding that if you take a lot of vitamin C, it'll actually help you prevent COVID or if you do get COVID from it being as severe. So vitamin C is pretty cool. If your kidneys aren't working right, then you're not getting the signal to make red blood cells. And there's the pernicious anemia that my grandfather and uncle died from. And they can't absorb B12 because they don't have intrinsic factor. If, for some reason, you have to have chemo, you have to have radiation, then you can actually destroy uh, your, your ability to make blood cells. If you take arsenic, heaven forbid that you should do that. If you're exposed to benzene in your job, or soldiers had to worry about mustard gas. And then there's some autoimmune diseases that will cause you to break down your own red blood cells. So autoimmune is where you attack your own body. And then just old age. Old people, again, they're not making uh, as much red blood cells. And their bone marrow has converted to fatty bone marrow. So they just are making uh, uh, blood in their flat bones. And as you get older and older, you get less and less. So it's not at all uncommon for old people to be anemic just because of their age. They just Their bodies just don't work as well. All right, another way that you can lose uh, blood, another type of anemia, is hemophilia. Now, in a minute, we're going to be talking about clotting factors. And the people with hemophilia are missing one or more of the clotting factors. So where you and I would maybe prick our finger and it would bleed for a minute and then it stopped bleeding, these people would just continue to bleed and continue to bleed because they have trouble clotting. So if it's just a, like a thorn prick or a, 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 a little nick from a knife, it's not such a big deal. But if they get hit in the kidneys, if they got tackled, and they started bleeding internally, they could easily die. So hemophilia is the lack of clotting factors, and it's something that you're, you inherit from one of your parents, one or both of your parents. All right. So that's called hemorrhagic, and you just bleed to death, basically. So you can bleed to death from being a car wreck. You can bleed to death if you have a blood vessel that pops. Now, I've never heard of anybody dying of menstruation, so I'm sitting here going, what? I don't even know about that. But I do know people who've died from ulcers. So if you have a place in your, uh, usually it's, it's where the food leaves your stomach and enters the small intestines, that acidity of the stomach acid hitting the uh, intestines can actually literally digest a hole. So you get a big bloody sore there, and that's what an ulcer is. So that's one of the main places that you get it is a duodenal ulcer, just where it leaves the stomach and eats a hole in the intestines. And that can kill you. You can bleed to death from that. But generally, you kind of get an idea that you have a problem because when you sit down on the toilet to poop, you bleed from your anus. So you should kind of have a clue that you have a really bad ulcer way before you die from it. And they can go in and, and uh, uh, fix that area, give you antibiotics, uh, give you something to neutralize the acid and give that area a chance to heal. So that's a whole other thing. Now, hemolytic anemia, these are things that cause your red blood cells to pop. So hemo, again, blood, red blood cells, hemoglobin. Lytic means pop. So hemolytic anemia, something is destroying the red blood cells. Some people have penicillin allergies, and it causes their red blood cells to pop. There are things that you can eat, like you know that there are certain mushrooms you cannot eat, you should not eat. 
and you know that some snakes and some spiders are poisonous. Not all snakes and not all spiders. So most of the snakes and spiders are our friends, but the ones that can bite us and poison us, uh, you need to know which ones those are and be able to identify them. If you are invaded by malaria parasites, so uh, it's spread by mosquitoes, and they go from one individual who has malaria, they pick up the parasite, and then they come over and bite the next person or draw blood from the next person, and they drop off some of these parasites, which then go into your red blood cells and make themselves at home and start having little baby uh, malaria parasites. So not a good thing. And I remember when AIDS first came out, and they were terrified that it could be spread by a mosquito bite. So a mosquito would bite somebody who had AIDS, and then it would go over and bite the next person and spread AIDS. But luckily, it is not spread that way. So that's great. That, that was a big relief. There are hereditary hemoglobin defects. This means you got it from your mom or your dad. And two of these are sickle cell disease and thalassemia. So those are, those are where you are genetically programmed to make a different kind of hemoglobin. And it doesn't work as well as regular, normal hemoglobin. And if you have somebody who gives you blood from someone else who does not have a matching blood type, all your blood's going to clot and your blood cells are going to pop and you're dead. So not a good thing to do. And you say, well, hopefully a hospital would not be stupid enough to give you a blood transfusion of blood that doesn't match your blood. But women who get pregnant, if they are Rh negative and the father is Rh positive, then he is giving her a baby that's going to make a toxic substance on its red blood cells. So as long as the baby stays in the placenta, stays inside the womb, then the mom is probably going to be fine, and the baby is probably going to be fine. But if for any reason there's a mingling of the blood from the mother and the baby, the mother's blood will actually attack the baby and can kill the baby. So one of the things that they're going to do if you're pregnant and you're RH negative is they're going to give you um, Rogam shots. So Rogam is a trade name for a, um, an immune globulin. And, and they give the mother an injection of this and it keeps the mother's antibodies from attacking the baby's blood. Now, they used to ask the woman to come in and have her blood tested and have the guy come in and have his blood tested. And if the guy was Rh negative and the mom was Rh negative, they thought, okay, well, that's fine. And then sometimes the baby would die. And so they, they suddenly realized that not every woman's husband is the father of her baby. You know, sometimes it's the mailman's. So nowadays, if you go in the hospital and you are Rh negative, they just give you the Rogam shot. Anyway, even though your husband is Rh negative, just like you are. So uh, they, they don't have to ask about the dad anymore because not every woman tells the truth about that. I know you're shocked, as I was. All right, so we were talking about... Um, sickle cell. This is actually, this is a normal cell. We've seen these things. There's the nucleus missing. And these are cells that have sickled. Look at how much bigger that shape is than this nice, compact, round shape. This is probably not going to fit through a capillary. And here's the tip of another sickled cell. Now, a person who has sickle cell anemia, again, they got it from their parents, one or the other or both of their parents, and if they are oxygen deprived, so what do you, what do, you do that will make you oxygen deprived? Well, you're running for the bus. You're running, 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 and then all of a sudden you can't breathe very well. 
if the a person with sickle cell gets into that situation where they're oxygen de oxygen deprived, then their cells will start sickling like this. So the object of the game is stop doing whatever you're doing. Take deep breaths and get the oxygen back in. And if you're lucky and they haven't sickled too far, they'll snap back into the round shape. But if they have gone too far and they're irreversibly sickled, then you're in trouble. So hopefully you have sense enough once you start, your cells start sickling to stop doing whatever it is that you're doing that's causing it and get some more oxygen. So I worry a little bit about people who have sickle cell and are wearing a mask as to whether or not it causes uh, the cells to start sickling. But they know it. They know it when it's sickling because they stop being able to go through capillaries and they have horrible pain. If, they, if you have too many of these who's, that sickle, then they're going to have to put you in the hospital. They may have to do a transfusion. They're definitely going to give you oxygen to try to keep the ones that haven't fully sickled to, to see if they'll go back to their normal shape. And, of course, they'll give you painkillers because, like I said, it's really painful to try to get this to go through a capillary uh, because it, it just won't go. It'll tear up the capillaries. This is probably the right time to be telling you this. So this is, this is kind of an interesting thing because why in the world, if you have sickle cell, would you pass that on to your children knowing that, that they're going to have the pain? And again, if you don't get medical care, if you can't afford medical care, then you'll, you can die because you can't transfer uh, enough oxygen throughout your body to keep yourself going. So why would this be so prevalent? Well, come to find out in areas around the equator where they have a lot of malaria. When malaria gets into the bloodstream, if it gets into enough of your red blood cells, then it's going to kill you because, again, you can't carry oxygen. So there would be epidemics of malaria that would go through and wipe out all these people. Well, some people survived and come to find out they had unusual hemoglobin. They had the sickle cell type of hemoglobin. And the malaria parasite doesn't like that kind of hemoglobin. It doesn't want to go into those cells. So when malaria would go through, the people who were left standing after the malaria went through would be the ones with the sickle cell, either one gene or two genes for it. So they were either heterozygous or homozygous. Those people survived. And then when it's time to get married, you look around and you, you can only marry people who also carry the... Um, um, sickle cell gene. So that's why it's, it's prevalent. Now, we don't have malaria, or if we do, we have very little of it in America. So we don't have to worry about it. So we don't have the same level of sickle cell as they do in places near the equator. So it seems kind of funny that a disease that is not something you would wish on anybody could actually save you from malaria. So I just paused for a second and went and looked to see what the latest statistics on are for deaths from malaria. It used to be anywhere from 1 to 3 million, and apparently last year there were only about half a million people who died from malaria. So we're getting medicines that stop malaria. We're learning to kill the mosquitoes that carry it. There's not, not all mosquitoes carry malaria, only certain ones do. So we're, we're starting to eradicate those to, to wipe them out. And, but of the people who get malaria, the ones that are almost always going to die are gonna be the kids under the age of five. So it's kind of the opposite of this COVID. This COVID seems to be hitting old people and, and not even bothering little kids. 
So most little kids are just fine or don't even show symptoms. But it's not true of malaria because think about little babies. They don't have very much blood. They're little. And so if the malaria parasite gets in and starts dividing and dividing and spreading through the red blood cells, then it doesn't take much to kill a, a baby or a young child. So they're, they're much more at risk. So and you, But um, like I said, we're down to about half a million that die worldwide of malaria. So we're definitely making progress, but we've definitely got a ways to go too. You should definitely read the story about this guy in your book. He was the one uh, who helped with blood transfusions. He saved so many lives during the war. And um, you can't really tell by looking, but he is considered to be a black man. And he's one of the first black men to get uh, a medical degree and to be working in transplant or uh, blood transfusion sciences. So we owe him ever so much. But oddly enough, when he was, um, I think in his 40s, he was in an accident and he bled to death. So his own technology, the stuff that he developed and saved so many lives by pioneering these methods, uh, were unable to save him. So anyway, make sure you read about him because he's kind of a neat guy. All right. So you did a lab for blood typing. And you found out that A blood has A antigens. B blood has B antigens. A person with AB blood has both A antigens and B antigens. One they got from their mom, one they got from their dad. And a person who has type O blood has neither A nor B. It doesn't have any of those A, A uh, glycoproteins or glycolipids, uh, nor the B ones. So, we call that a recessive state. And you had to have gotten a recessive gene from your mother, and you had to get a recessive gene from your dad. Now, here's the really weird thing about this. If you look at this table, it says, it, just looking at the United States, and you can look at this for other countries, too, because it's also interesting for other countries. Well, there's a little bit. There is some other countries, too. Uh, other nationalities, anyway. So white people, Caucasian people, are about 45% type O. So almost half of them are type O. Well, recessive is usually a very small percentage, like 25% or less. And here, so 45%, how weird is that? And, and uh, people who are black are even more, have more type O, Hispanics even more. 63% of Hispanic people are type O. Japanese are closer to what you would expect at 31%. And Native Americans, the, the um, people who, who traditionally we think of as living on reservations in the United States, are almost 80% type O. So one of the things that we'll uh, talk about, hopefully, in another chapter, are major histocompatibility complexes. And so one of the interesting things about major histocompatibility complexes, those are some other proteins and glycolipids and glycoproteins that stick up off of your cells. And apparently, they, they smell. So it's not like you walk up to somebody and go, whoa, you stink. You know, it's not, it's not like B.O. kind of thing. But it's apparently a smell. And some people are attracted to that smell. So even though you, you aren't aware of smelling in that particular way, you, you are giving off a, an odor, a pheromone perhaps, 
and that attracts. So my my theory is that people who have type O blood smell good to other people who have type O blood, and so they're more likely to get married and have babies than, say, somebody who has type A blood. So anyway, but there's something, there's some sort of a weird selection thing going on there because that's not at all normal for a recessive gene. So when we do genetics, you'll realize like, whoa, that is seriously off. So you remember doing Punnett squares? So anyway, if you've forgotten, you should go back and review Punnett squares. All right. So a person who has type O blood has antibodies against type A and antibodies against type B. A person who has type A blood has antibodies against B. A person who has type B blood has antibodies against A. And a person who has type AB blood does not have antibodies against A, nor does it have antibodies against B, because if they did, they'd clot their own blood. So hopefully you guys learned that very well in your lab. But I just want to show you this table because this is so amazing about the recessive type of uh, blood. All right. And this is just a little picture showing you that what's sticking up off of type O blood, type A blood, type B blood, and AB. So it's got the B and it's got the A. And this doesn't have either of those subunits hanging off of it. So you don't have to memorize the structure or any of that stuff. But so anyway, it's just the artist telling you something. Now, when I talk about your blood clumping, you have antibodies. And antibodies are little Y-shaped thingamajiggies. They're little Y-shaped proteins. And you see it sticks on to this, and it'll stick on to this one, and all of the red blood cells will then clump together. So you get that agglutination or clumping effect due to antibodies. So we'll spend time in the immune system talking about antibodies and the different kinds that you have. But this is just to kind of show you, it's like, I'm holding onto this one, I'm holding onto this one, so they can't get away, and this one's holding onto that one, which is holding onto that one. And so that's how you get your clumping. All right, and this is what type A would look like. The A antibodies clump, B did not. Type B, this one clumped, this one did not. Excuse me, this one clumped, this one did not. Uh, type AB, they both clump. And type O, neither one of them clump when you put the antibodies on them. So make sure you, you understand that because you're going to get it in a lecture and you're going to get it in a lab too. So just make sure you understand. So here's a little cartoon showing you somebody uh, getting a transfusion uh, from, this is a person who has type B blood and they accidentally gave them a transfusion from somebody who had type A blood and there goes all of their blood clotting. So they don't have long to live. All right, and here's the lady who is Rh negative. So she's not born with antibodies against the Rh factor, but if any part of the baby's blood gets into the mother, maybe She's fine all nine months, but whenever the bag breaks and the baby's coming out, there can be a mingling of blood, and she's going to be sensitized. She's going to make antibodies, and the next time that she gets pregnant, she's ready and waiting for that baby. So usually the first baby, as long as there's no rupturing of the, of the uh, placenta, then, then the mother's going to be okay. But if there is, then she is primed, she's made antibodies, and the next time she gets pregnant, then her antibodies can go in and destroy the baby's blood. 
So it's really important to have uh, an immune globulin given to the mother to block her from making antibodies against the, the next baby. So that's why Rogam shots are important, and it's why it's really important to have good prenatal care because one of the first things they do in prenatal care is draw your blood and make sure that you're not Rh negative. And most women are not Rh negative. So it's just the ones that are that we have to worry about them attacking the baby's blood. All right, this next picture is a... Um, all right, so this one is an eosinophil. And eosinophil is one of the five types of red blood, or excuse me, white blood cells that you have. You can tell this is not a red blood cell because it still has a nucleus. It's kind of an irregular shaped nucleus. It's not a nice sphere. And the edges are kind of, uh, they have little projections called fake feet, pseudopods, fake feet. It's got ribosomes. But what gives it away, and we know this is an eosinophil, is it, it has these, these bags, these granules in it that stain red. So when we get to the uh, chapter on the immune system, we will talk about basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils, uh, monocytes, and uh, leukocytes. So we'll, we'll talk more about those. But just know that if there's a nucleus in it, it's a white blood cell. All right. And this is a breakdown. Now, a lot of times when you go in and you have your blood drawn, they'll just look and see if you have elevated white blood cells. But they don't do what we call a differential. They don't differentiate and say, oh, it's mostly neutrophils, or oh, it's mostly eosinophils, or mostly basophils. So you really need to know so a lot of times they'll have another blood test. They'll draw, do another blood draw, and then they'll do a differential. So I don't know why they don't do a differential every time they do a blood count, but, you know, I'm sure it has to do with the cost of it and the, the way that they code it for billing. And there's your lymphocytes and your monocytes. And monocytes, are the, they're huge in comparison with the red blood cells. They're huge. And a lymphocyte is almost the same size as a red blood cell. And it doesn't have those granules like these do. You can see those little granules, the white granules, excuse me, the, the pink granules, the purple granules, and the blue granules. So these are not granulocytes. These are granulocytes. Oh, buddy. And there's your neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil. Like I said, we're going to go over these when we get into the uh, immune system. Monocyte. Now, I will tell you something about the monocyte that's kind of interesting. Is it's normally kind of, I mean, it's big. It's big. But as soon as it encounters uh, an infection of some sort, maybe uh, worms, viruses, whatever, it will swell up even bigger. And it will go around and start eating things. And we call it a macrophage at that point. So monocytes are just kind of on patrol. And I don't know if you guys saw um, the Hulk and Dave Banner. And so he's just going along and he's just kind of a man. And then he gets mad. And he gets enraged and he turns into the Hulk. So the monocyte kind of does that. It turns into these great big eating machines called macrophages. So that's kind of fun. All right. This is kind of an overview of what we were talking about. And if you, if you have a stem cell, it's committed to be blood, but it hasn't decided whether it's going to become a white blood cell or red blood cell, or a megakaryocyte, which is going to be platelets. So it hasn't quite decided yet which, which of the blood components it's going to be. Uh, more slides. Okay, now, if you were looking at this, you have very few white blood cells, and this is normal. 
Actually, this is a lot compared to a lot of people. So, but you notice mostly red blood cells with just a scattering here and there of a white blood cell. If you saw this, then you're like, oh no, this person has leukemia. So you can have leukemia where you make too many of any of the different kinds of white blood cells. So uh, my sister has um, the one where it's, uh, she makes too many leukocytes. So, um, unfortunately, but, or fortunately, I should say, she had a bone marrow transplant that was almost 100% match, and so she's um, still alive 10 years later. So I'm very happy with that. All right, this is a platelet. If you look at a platelet, first of all, they're kind of irregular, and they do have those pseudopods or fake feet sticking out. But usually they don't have very many of them unless they are getting ready to clot. So mostly they kind of look like this. And there's no nucleus in there. There are some dark staining things in there, but that's not the nucleus. That's not the nucleus. That's just granules that they've got in there with something that they're storing. So, And they're much, much, much smaller than the um, red blood cells. So let's see if we can go into... Uh, let's see. All right, if you're looking at this person who has leukemia, this little thing right there, that's a platelet. See that little tiny purple speck right there where my cursor is? That's a platelet. And this one, the picture is so, so small that you actually can't see the platelets. But here and there, there's a little purple speck. And that's your platelets. So they're actually a fragment of a cell. They're not a whole cell. All right, and we were talking about that monocyte that's mild-mannered and running around looking for trouble, and when it finds it, it can actually crawl out of the blood system, crawl out of the vessels, and crawl into the tissues. And here's a picture. So here's your red blood cell, and look how big this thing is now. That's why I say it's kind of like a hulk. It's like, yes, and it's going to start eating stuff. So, uh, next slide that we're supposed to talk about is how does a blood clot occur? And this is a really hot topic right now because some people who are getting COVID are developing blood clots. And we're really curious why, you know, most people don't. But there's the occasional person that just starts throwing blood clots. And if you throw enough blood clots, it'll kill you. So what's going on? Well, we know the steps of blood clotting. So here's, here's just kind of an overview. Here is where they've torn open this vessel right here. Maybe they pricked their finger on a, on a thorn. Maybe they were cutting open a bagel and they sliced their finger. Who knows what caused the injury? But normally you have epithelial cells lining your blood vessels and they call them endothelial cells because it's inside your body instead of outside your body but so these are these are uh, squamous epithelial cells and as long as platelets are touching your body's cells like that then it, everything is fine but as soon as you cut through now these platelets are no longer touching these cells, but it's actually touching the underlying collagen. So these are collagen fibers that are underneath. That's what these cells sit on. And as soon as these platelets touch that, they change shape, they start sending out pseudopods, and they clot. They start the whole clotting process. So here's a platelet plug and red blood cells get caught in there and white blood cells get caught in there. Now if this was outside where you could see it then we would call it a scab. So you guys know about scab formation. Well this is an internal scab and we call it a blood clot. So there's the platelet plug, there's the collagen fibers that cause it to transform from just a, a mild-mannered platelet into a sticky platelet. And then you have fibrin, 
that kind of is a fiber that forms and kind of ties the whole thing together, makes it a little bit stronger. So people who have uh, hemophilia, are they, they still have platelets. They can still make platelet plugs, but they don't have the clotting factor to completely make the blood clot and do this whole uh, thing. So they're going to continue to bleed. All right, so here is an overview of what we were talking about. You damage your tissue, you expose the uh, collagen, and then you have uh, thromboplastin, which is one of the factors. And they, some of them are just called factor seven and factor nine and so on. So these factors turn on and make, excuse me, go this way, make a cascade. The platelets say, okay, come on, let's do this thing. And so here you have the progression of factors turning on. And if you're missing any one of these factors, you can see that this process will just stop right there. So uh, if you're missing eight, so that VIII -I -I is eight, factor eight. If you get all the way down here, the platelets are doing their job, these factors are doing their job, and then bang, you can't finish making the clot. So here's an actual picture of a clot. This is, this is a real picture that they've taken through an electron microscope and they've, they've colorized it to make the red blood cells red and the fibrin, fibers uh, kind of a shredded wheat color. So I'm not going to ask you to memorize all the cascade. Uh, if you go into hematology, then they probably will want you to do that. But be aware that if you're missing any of these factors, then you can't go from the platelet all the way down, all the way down. The prothrombin activator makes prothrombin, which makes thrombin, which helps make the fibrinogen turn into fibrin, and then the fibrin polymerizes to make this shredded wheat-looking stuff. So it's a whole complicated process and hopefully you have every single one of them going on in your body. So I'd like you to know about fibrin, because these are the fibers, fibrin. And I'd like you to know that there are activators that will cause the thrombin to be activated, which will then cause fibrinogen to turn into fibrin. So the reason I ask you to learn that one is because they look for your prothrombin time. So they take your blood and they put a drop of it and they watch it clot and they time it. And they say, okay, it took you less than a minute for that little drop of blood to clot. So they have little, little tables and they can look it up and they can say, okay, this is how long it should take for that to, to occur. Here's the stuff that was on that other slide, but they put in a nice little table for you. And I just wanna point out about two things on this table. One of them is you notice most of this stuff takes place in the liver, and some of it takes place in the platelets themselves. So pretty much the platelets and the livers are the ones that determine whether or not your blood is gonna clot. The other thing I wanna point out is fibrinogen is the precursor of fibrin, and prothrombin is the precursor of thrombin. So in your body, you have to make proteins by this whole process, which hopefully you already learned. If not, you really need to check out um, the process by which messenger RNA turns into um, or goes into ribosomes and is read by transfer RNA and it makes amino acids go together to make proteins. So you got this whole process going on. So it takes a little while. So if you cut yourself with a knife or you um, are in a car accident or you pull your tooth, you know, anywhere you're going to have where you're bleeding, 
You don't have time for your body to say, oh, wait a minute, I need some fibrin, I need some thrombin, I need all these factors and things. So what you're going to do is, in times where you don't need them, you're going to make them, but you're going to make them in an inactive form. Because if they were active, then your blood would clot. So you don't want them in an active form but you want to go ahead and make them. So that's the fibrinogen and the prothrombin have extra pieces added on to them so that they don't work. So now when it's time to have your blood clot, then all you need is an enzyme, cut off the extra piece, and turn the fibrinogen into fibrin, and uh, the prothrombin becomes thrombin. And there you go, because enzymes can work really quickly. But when you're trying to make whole proteins, then that's a kind of a, a longer process. And you might bleed to death while you're busy doing it. So those are the couple of things that I wanted you to see. The liver is where a lot of the components, a lot of the factors are. And then some of them are actually in the platelets themselves. So that and then... You already have these in your bloodstream. You already have these in your liver. And they're just waiting for the chance to be useful. Like Thomas the Train. Like my grandson talks about all the time. And here's yet another slide pretty much telling you. You go through the factors. You get the prothrombin activator, which makes thrombin, which then causes the fibrin, uh, fibrinogen to become fibrin. So it's just another picture telling you the same information, pretty much. And then here's a feedback mechanism. So one of the things that you, you do is you do want to clot, but then at some point you actually want to break it down. So you're going to have to dissolve the clot because the skin has healed. So if it's on the outside and it's a scab, it'll just fall off. But if it's on the inside, then you're going to have to actually eat the, the clot, eat the scab that's inside. So again, I'm not going to go into this depth. You're welcome to learn it. And here are blood disorders. So, let's see which one you need to know about. Okay, thrombocytopenia. Penia means not enough. Penia is insufficiency. Cyto means cell. And thrombocytes is another name for platelets. So, this is somebody who doesn't have enough platelets. So, a lot of times, it's because the person is busy making red blood cells instead, or they're making white blood cells. So people who have leukemia would have thrombocytopenia, and people who have been exposed to nasty drugs or radiation. So this is one of the things you have to be careful about in your job. Sometimes you're exposed to really dangerous chemicals that can actually get in and, and uh, hurt your bone marrow. So your, every job is required. If there is something that's dangerous and could hurt you, they have to tell you about those chemicals. All right, thalassemia. We don't hear a lot about it. it this would be more in uh, the Greeks, Italians, people of Mediterranean descent, although they come over here and they bring their thalassemia with them. So it is hereditary. And they can't make the correct kind of hemoglobin. So they have very low red blood cell counts because if you can't make hemoglobin, you don't have anything to put in your red blood cells. So obviously this is not a, a good thing. Septicemia, this is where you get bacteria growing in your bloodstream. So if I take a sample of your blood and look, it under the, look at it under the microscope, I should not find any bacteria whatsoever. None. And that's because your white blood cells are on patrol going through your blood vessels and if they see a bacteria they eat it. And so you shouldn't see any. But if you get such an overwhelming bacterial load 
that your body can't eat all the bacteria fast enough, then they can colonize your bloodstream and it causes uh, fever, chills, nausea, and this, which we'll talk about in just a second, or septic shock. So uh, it can be fatal. And I actually had a friend who lost their child to this. The kid felt well enough to go play basketball that night. The next morning, he was so sick uh, that he was that he died before they could get him to um, airlift him to Vanderbilt Hospital to try and take care of it. So uh, can come on quickly, and I'm trying to think. Um, the guy that did the Muppets, uh, Jim Henson, died of a bacterial overgrowth. So usually we can keep them under control, but sometimes, for some reason, they they invade the bloodstream, and they need to start um, antibiotics, IV antibiotics, to save your life. Infectious mononucleosis, we talked about that in the last tape. That is where it's called a kissing disease, and you infect B lymphocytes with Epstein-Barr virus. So we haven't talked about lymphocytes, but there are B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. So we'll talk about those when we get to the immune chapter. It most commonly occurs in teenagers, and it's expensive. You uh, swap slobber, as we used to call it. So drinking after somebody who's got this will cause it. Kissing somebody who's got it will cause it. Uh, the main thing, it's self-limiting and usually resolves in a few weeks. But during those weeks, you are out. You will sleep and sleep and sleep. All right. So... This is, this is something that we're seeing now with people with COVID. So it's been around. We've, we've seen it before, but we're seeing more of it with COVID. You have widespread, excuse me, widespread clotting within unbroken vessels. Now, you're not supposed to clot inside of a vessel because you don't see any collagen. So... Often it's just in one of your organs, or it could be throughout your whole body. Sometimes it's triggered by bacteria. It can happen when your blood circulation slows. So if you've had a heart attack, your, your heart is not beating correctly, or it's not beating fast enough or thoroughly enough, and the blood that circulates to your body slows down. Anytime that happens, then you start having um, the blood to clot. So once you have the vessels that are filling up with clotted blood, then the tissue around, it starts dying. And so um, a weird something going on. And why it's happening with... Um, some people, not all people, but some people are getting this when they get uh, COVID. So it's like, why? Why is that happening? All right, this is kind of gross and fun. Um, if you lose a finger, you know, they always say, well, grab the finger or the toe or whatever it is that you cut off and put it on ice and try to get to the hospital with it. And they can try and reattach it. So we have people who know how to reattach the nerves, how to reattach the blood vessels, how to reattach the skin. So it is, it is a, not everybody can do it. Not every surgeon can do it. So you have special people who do this sort of thing. But one of the things that happens, a lot of times you sew the finger back on or you sew the toe back on or um, in the case of this lady who cut her husband's penis off because she was mad at him, um, they had to reattach the penis. And you need to get the blood flowing back through the finger or back th through whatever it is that you just sewed back on. Because if you can't get the blood to flow through those vessels, and remember, as soon as you cut something, it's going to start clotting. So you got to get through those clots. 
and then the blood has to get past the clots. So somebody said, well, leeches are really good at dissolving blood clots. And so they actually have medicinal leeches, and they grow them, and that you only use them on one person because you don't want this leech then to go put on somebody else and then start, you know, exchanging blood with the next person. So they put the leech on, and it's got this little mouthpiece that kind of sticks through the skin, and then they just start slurping up the blood. And they don't care whether it's fresh blood or if they're dissolving a blood clot. So because they're putting a gentle suction they can actually start the blood flow going back through fingers or reattached body parts. So it's so funny. We've come full circle. Back a long time ago, they would put leeches on people to suck their blood out because they thought they had evil humors in their blood. And then we, just, we said, well, that's just silly. We don't have evil humors. We have, you know, uh, infectious uh, viruses or bacteria or something in there. It's not evil humors. And so they stopped using leeches. And then when they realized that they could restart blood circulation or get rid of clotted blood around an incision, then they started using them again. So I think they would have to put me to sleep before they did this. I think I would be freaked out to have leeches sucking on me. I was looking back over my notes to see if I had forgotten to talk about something. Like I said, I'm not used to talking over PowerPoint slides, so it's that's a new concept for me. I usually just have a set of notes, and I just talk from my notes. But platelets are cool because not only do they cause the blood clot to occur, but they're going to secrete a growth factor into the area where the clot is, and it causes the cells in that area to start doing mitosis, to start dividing, and it'll fill in. So in the case of this guy right here, he's got to make all those cells in across where he was cut here. And so if they divide and divide and divide, then they can take these stitches out, and it'll just be a smooth sheet of skin where the cells have divided. So that's one of the cool things that platelets do. They also secrete vasoconstrictors. So even a person with hemophilia, when they cut themselves, the blood vessels will spasm and contract. And so it'll slow down the blood flow. So even though they can't clot correctly, they can have their blood vessels spasm and close off due to the platelets. So, you know, if it's not really a severe injury, then they will get over it. So uh, there's hope for hemophiliacs because of their platelets. Um, and they also have the enzymes in them, not only to make a clot, but then to dissolve a clot. And uh, another interesting thing that they do is they send out a chemical signal throughout the bloodstream, and the white blood cells that can crawl, they literally crawl. They just kind of ooze along. And if you put some on a microscope slide and look at them, you can actually watch them crawl around on the microscope slide. It is seriously awesome. So your neutrophils have the ability to crawl, and those monocytes, the ones that I kind of compared to the Hulk, they will be called by the chemical signal that the platelet is sending out, and they will crawl to the area of injury. And if there's any bacteria in the area or worms or anything that needs to be eaten, then they will grow and become an angry um, um, macrophage and start eating whatever needs to be eaten in the area. So platelets are really cool. They do a lot of really interesting stuff. And I wanted to talk about, uh, oh, the name of the condition where the baby's blood is being attacked by his mother is called 
erythroblastosis fatalis. So it's a fetal, it's a fetal situation. So it's an unborn baby. And what else was important? Ah, you need to know, and I talked about this in lab, but I'm going to talk about it in lecture because you really, really, really need to know it. The universal donor blood type is O negative because they don't have any A antigens, they don't have any B antigens, and they don't have the rhesus monkey antigen. So you can give any blood type O negative. So it's a universal donor. And AB positive is the universal recipient. So they can take any blood. They can take A blood. They can take B blood. They can take O blood because they don't have antibodies against any of those. They don't have antibodies against A. They don't have antibodies against B. And they don't have antibodies against the rhesus monkey um, factor. So they're the universal recipient. A couple of more interesting facts that I'll throw out there. Um, men have fewer blood vessels than women out in their skin. So it's most guys won't blush as much as women do because they don't have as many blood vessels. And they hypothesize that the reason they don't is because men are always fighting, or at least in the past they were always fighting. And if they had a lot of blood vessels that were close to the surface, then it would be more uh, easy for them to bleed to death. They would, so anyway, I thought that was interesting. Um, women lose twice as much iron, and part of it is because, you know, uh, we menstruate, but part of it is because we don't store as much in our liver as the guys do. So there are differences between men and women. And let's see. Ah, back when we were talking about CPR and keeping the heart going, I just wanted to uh, throw in here, how do you do CPR? If you breathe in oxygen and blow out carbon dioxide, here's a person who's laying there, they can't breathe on their own, and you open their mouth and you blow carbon dioxide in them. So, so how does that benefit them? And I was like, oh, man. So I took a CPR course and was, was learning about it, and come to find out that most of the air around you, about 80%, is nitrogen and about 20% is oxygen and if you add 80% and 20% you're almost at 100% there so there is a very little carbon dioxide in the air it's like 0.02 to 0.04 percent so very 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 little so even though you are breathing in oxygen at 20% and breathing out oxygen at like 19 point uh, whatever 0.04 would be uh, from 20%. So almost no carbon dioxide, very, very little. So the person you're breathing into their mouth is still getting almost 20% oxygen just like you breathed in with very little carbon dioxide. So there's a lot of misconception about carbon dioxide and global warming and all kind of stuff like that. But uh, most people don't realize how little carbon dioxide there is in the air. So I just wanted to point that out. So feel free, if somebody's not breathing, to breathe in their mouth and see if you can't save them by putting oxygen into their bloodstream. So I'll leave you with one last thought. You are sitting there making about a million red blood cells every second. So while you've been listening to me talk, think of all the millions and millions of red blood cells that you made to replace all of those that are dying.